an immense amount of little tiny units called neurons that individually are kind of dumb and they're not very efficient, when they act together at the level of millions and billions of them, you have now a machine that is not a piece of meat anymore, but is a machine that creates meaning. I want to ask you now, as a neuroscientist, please tell me what you have seen from your uh, line of expertise related to all these things we're talking about, musical phenomenology and how we perceive, uh, we experience music through sound and all that. Please, I'm very curious to know that. So consciousness in the realm of cognitive neuroscience or cognitive psychology, it's a phenomena that doesn't have more than 20, 25 years of serious, of really serious like study. And if you think about neuroscience in general, neuroscience doesn't have more than 100, I would say 100 years, 120 wow. years. That has several challenges, um, including the fact that we are just now, by now, I would say like agreeing on what do we mean by consciousness? Wow. What do we mean by... Uh, a scientific study of consciousness. The very good thing is that the science is so new that we have so much space for growing and there are so much space for, for, for doing, trying new things. Um, but at the same time, you have all the challenges that are related to, well, this is a new science. So how do we approach this object called consciousness? I advocate for one view, which is basically the idea that if you don't study experience, if you don't study uh, how does it feel to experience something, then you're not studying consciousness at all. Consciousness is, by definition, if you want, subjective experience. And if you're not tackling that problem from a scientific point of view, then you're studying something else. Maybe you're studying perception, maybe you're studying attention, maybe you're studying memory, but you're not studying what consciousness is and that is really difficult to study because then how how do you put that into an experiment how do you measure that how do you go into a a, 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 a neuroimaging device and then you scan someone looking for what that experience is music is is in that sense a very very peculiar way of of thinking about consciousness because it has the ingredients of what defines consciousness, which is the subjective experience of something. In this case, what we have been discussing, this feeling of transcendence, which is an experience in itself. I would not say it's a feeling, because a feeling can be very yeah, low. Feeling is a, yeah, it's, feeling I, would, is a, I would call it an experience. It's not something that you can put the finger on, like the Dalai Lama used to say. That I really like that. So a feeling, you can identify what anger is, what, what love is. But in the case of this kind of transcendental Experiences. Experience. There is, there is no way of labeling it. So on that note, I think what you can do is just basically try to evoke those moments and try a way of getting into a, a device that allows you to measure brain activity and try to characterize them. There is no other way. You cannot explain what, what musical experience is. You cannot explain what consciousness is. But at least you can try to characterize them by using... Uh, neuroscience. I've been really interested in, uh, in, in the well, in the last few few, I would say years, um, in in trying to understand not necessarily what music is, but mainly what these very peculiar experiences are. And one of them is basically this this sense of uh, the, the 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 creative the creative aspect of the mind, right? So creativity is a very very peculiar very particular experience that usually comes in different flavors and it's really hard again to put the finger on it. So what I wanted to say very briefly is that I think we are not ready yet for answering the question of um, of experience from, wow. from a neurobiological perspective. We are not even close to, to do so. But you're mentioning something that you said that there is at least <clears throat> something that you can try to poke your instruments at, which is, for example, when a masterpiece exists, then it creates some sort of expectation, and then... There is a very, very interesting line of research from, 
from a neuroscientist who is an Argentinian who who is from McGill. He's he's at McGill in Canada. His name is Robert Satorre. Uh, we can we can actually link some of his work. He has done some something very unique, which is trying to first of all characterize what what musical perception is in the brain. And what he basically discovered is that there are two systems in the brain that are not isolated, but they talk to each other when we perceive music. Wow. And one of them is basically like a very, very ancient structure in the brain that is uh, not, not from the cortex, not from the, from the, from the, from the actual more, uh, from the phylogenetically more new um, piece of the brain, but from deep, deeper structures. Wow. And those structures are intimately related uh, with the release of a chemical that um, it's responsible for your feeling from your experience of pleasure. And that chemical is called dopamine. Wow. And there is a very deep structure that basically releases that, that uh, dopamine every time that you are actually experiencing pleasure by listening music. There is this very old structure that releases dopamine, but there is also this more like phylogenetically new piece of the brain that is called the cortex which is the superficial as the superficial part of your of your brain that is mainly there for processing information that comes from your senses for instance in, uh, auditory information that comes uh, from your ears but also the more frontal part of your neocortex that is responsible for uh, things like predicting the future or for wow. anticipation. They have performed several experiments where they make musicians to play and they try to, to basically create a pattern that is actually consistent with itself or it has certain kind, certain notes that don't belong to the, to the uh, let's say, to the piece naturally. And as you were mentioning before, every time that you hear something that is dissonant or that, that doesn't belong to the structure, you immediately have some kind of weird reaction. That challenges the experience of unity, that fragments our Ex perception. Yeah, exactly. So the brain is really good at predicting what's next. Wow. The brain is really good at predicting whether or not the next note should be the correct one or not. This one or that. And you are and you are able to actually measure signals in the brain. Wow. When you are actually violating that prediction. What happens when you have the supermasters is that they create the background of where in the storytelling of the musical discourse we might think that it goes, we expect, based on what you just said, for the music to go here. But they surprise us by going there. But then we realize, oh my gosh, this is so much better than what I anticipated. And that dopamine comes out, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, it's Beethoven would say, this is a combination of the surprising and the beautiful. Yes, exactly. So it's, it's a very nice interplay between a system that is there for basically to to um to generate reward but basically as a matter of survival that's why that's that's why that system is there so basically every time that you have some kind of behavior that allows you to improve your ability to survive the system has to be rewarded by itself so the way how the brain rewards itself is by releasing dopamine Dopamine is also at the basis of addictions. And at the same time, you have this anticipatory system that is more like neocortical. And, and the, 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 the chat between these two systems wow. is what characterizes, I would say, like the fingerprint of, of musical experience. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say exactly of musical experience, that you're always trying to anticipate. And the moment that you are able to do so, your brain is rewarding yourself with a bit of dopamine. I've been always been fascinated on of the fact that musicians seem to be so, <laughs> I wouldn't say addicted, but they seem to be so addicted to what they do in the sense that they are fulfilling their destiny day by day, minute by minute, hour by hour. And one way of putting that neuroscientifically is that they're basically just swimming in brain juice that allows them to stay in that state. That we're dopamine junkies. 
Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's your dopamine junkie. Oh yeah. man. Well, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go philosophical on this. I didn't know any of this thing you just said. I just find out about this now. But I would say that I really have explained it for myself as there is nothing more rewarding or nothing more fulfilling than exercising that for which I was created. There's nothing more fulfilling than exercising and realizing fulfilling purpose. It's how the brain creates meaning. So how an immense amount of little tiny units called neurons that individually are kind of dumb and they're not very efficient, when they act together at the level of millions and billions of them, you have now a machine that is not a piece of meat anymore, but is a machine that creates meaning. That's a fascinating question on, on what are the mechanisms by which the brain is able to, to, to create, to extract meaning out of perception. And meaning is also different for, for all of us. So what is meaningful to you, it might not be meaningful to me, but we all have the ability to experience meaningful stuff. Correct. And of course, then... As a convicted follower of Christ, like I said before, I would say literally that's a mark for me of the existence of soul as well, that there is another aspect that is beyond mere science, which is literally this the spiritual aspect of the reality of, of, of the, human, the human being. It would be really nice to, to, for me, actually, as an exercise to discuss with you, what are the actual scientific evidence of... Musical transcendence. So if wow. there are any kind of line of research out there wow. that is specifically tackling the problem of transcendence and how can you actually quant quantify that in, in terms of brain activity? Within the realm of our expertise, this is very not normal, not talked about, not taught. In order to experience transcendence, we need to experience a unified yes. experience. Yeah. Again, this is what amazingly sounds weird, but it's, it's fantastic. And I can illustrate it in a very practical way. Imagine this is the beginning of the piece and this is the end. So the end is contained in the beginning and the beginning is contained in the end. So there's a unity, there's no separation. The not only expectation, but the seed of where this thing that starts here is going to be fulfilled or culminated, it is already ingrained. And as we keep the unity of this, mm -hmm. then to the perception of a monad again, of a singularity, I can transcend. People go like, Pedro, you're crazy. How can you appease experience the end and the beginning and the beginning and the end? It's very easy. Doctor, for example, my name is Pedro Jose. For my friends, I'm poopy, okay? Poopy. In my family, that's when they call me poopy. Oh! But when my mother will call Pedro Jose, I will start running away because I know I did something wrong. She's not exactly. calling me poopy. She's calling me Pedro Jose. Only in very special circumstances. Pedro Jose is made out of four syllables. Pedro Jose. There are four separated sounds that has vowels and consonants in it that exists from a beginning, Pedro Jose, to an end. They are stated in physical chronological time. Because when I say P is a second, then two seconds later, it finishes with the Jose thing. So this is a perfect example. And I take this example from my master, Mark Antakar, which is brilliant. Is I do not experience those four syllables as separate as P. Dro, o, se, no. Or even as letters, P, E, D, R, O. No, 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 no. Even though they exist in time, I perceive them as a unity. Pedro Jose, I'm running because I know my mama's gonna kick the heck out of me or something exactly. because I did something wrong. You see what yeah. I mean? I, I perceive mean. that as a unity, how powerful it is. That music being an art form that exists and manifests itself physically in time, chronological time, is an atemporal experience. And yeah. tones, sounds, wow. being physical, objectively quantifiable elements that we can have 
the, 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 the frequency, we can have the harmonic content with FFTs, with fast Fourier transform. We can see the harmonic content of things. We can see the amplitude, how loud they are. We can literally see the internal components, I call the harmonics, within each one of the individual sounds. Those tones, although they're objective and they're physical, physically capable to be studied, are the porters of a reality that is immaterial. I love that. <laughs> so my whole thing, my whole thing is to be able to get to a point in which all of this is transparent. I know where the climax in the Mozart flute concerti are and why. Musically, why? Coming back to the question of Maestro Maria Guinan in 1978. Now I have that knowledge. But you know what? It is when I'm talking, when I'm starting with Maestro uh, Cristina, when I started, I'm a little bit less bad now. But she said, Pedro, you're thinking still too much. I can hear in your playing that you're pointing me out to where the climax is. <laughs> it's incredible. She goes, wow. her perception is so incredibly developed. She, she killed me with this. She went, I can, I can hear you think through your playing. Wow. And he's getting to a place, she's going, bravo, now you're not thinking, you're Noema. So that all this knowledge, all this intellectual thing, all this analyzing, all this, I have to put this color here, I have to put more here, my lesser, all of that has to disappear so that it becomes something. That's why Charlie Bidake says, la musique n'est rien, in French, is music is nothing. But I would, you don't do anything, it just happens. Of course, you have to create a whole... Yes. The architecture for that. I would say, correct. And I would say that music is not enough material, physically objective. But of course, it is an experience and a heavy transcendental experience. The problem is that we tend to confuse beautiful sounds or even emotional moments or deeply moving emotional content things with music. Sorry. For me, that's not music. That's beautiful sounds. That's... Touching, moving things, and music is something so much higher in my conviction. I agree on that apparent, well, it's not an apparent, it's actually a very, like, it's a paradox, but it's a very interesting one because it's an existential paradox. The fact that the entities, the physical units, the, the physicality of music even though it doesn't contain what the observer, what the listener is actually experiencing, carries some information of that experience anyways. There is some aspect of the subject that is also incorporated into this equation. Yeah, we, right? we, 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 we talked about that, right? In the sense, in the sense that I have, there, again, there are three elements that should be in place for music to happen. Based on Maestro Takar, a masterpiece. I don't know if I can be that extreme, but <laughs> that's the way he goes. A masterpiece. Let's say a, good, a decent piece. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Because, I mean, if we have garbage, it's hard to get gold out of garbage. It's, it's really, really hard. Really, yes. really, really. Yet, we can illustrate the principles of unity with very simple songs. A maestro, maestro, uh, uh, did that. Da climax if i do that sounds like the radio now. Thank you. <laughs> it's it's sad. It really is. Vehicle, the piece. We need performers capable of conveying the substance the f the, the, that comes, the essence that comes from that piece. And we need a listener who is willing to pay the price to live back home any predetermination or any nothing and be open and be free to be able to experience the content 
of what that peace allows that is being articulated or it is being brought to life yeah. Yeah. by the performer that then can be. And the other thing Charlie Bidaka says, literally, he says he doesn't come to convince anybody to do anything. He comes to experience something. He comes to experience freedom. Exactly. For me, exactly. I, come, I come to experience elevation huh? as uh, an expression of gratitude and, 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 and honor to the creator of the universe. And, and it's an incredibly powerful thing. I totally agree with him that it's not something that you convey by a message. It's, it's not something that I need to, that I, that I use for convincing you. It's something that you have to experience. I have to experience. And we have to agree upon a discussion or over a beer or something like that. When I was in the Glasgow concert, I remember, th and I was with Stani Mira Georgieva, you know Stani, Dr. Of course, Stani. Dr. Stani. And I, w I was with her, but that was, in, that was, uh, I think she, she experienced the same thing in a different concert. I think she was in Amsterdam. But I was in Glasgow and it was like one and a half years in between. At the very end of uh, the Interstellar tune, Stay. Oh my gosh. Where the music just goes up and up and up and up and up. And at some point there is silence. And the silence sounds stronger than the entire moving up. And when I experienced that with the orchestra there, I, 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 can, I can tell because I felt it, that I touched something somewhere that it was beyond the um, whatever I experienced before in my life. You transcended. You transcended. I, I, yeah, I, I, I just touched it. You transcended. That's what it is. You mentioned something extremely, extremely important. Why? Because the conditions were correct in the sense of Hans is a scary phenomenologist. <laughs> scary. I've met some of them. Hermeto Pascual is one. Ravi Shankar is a genius phenomenologist. We, we could say that he's kind of a Mozart in our time. Like, literally, what I experienced with them, what I saw with my eyes, was like seeing something like a Mozart being expressed through Indian music, but The, the process, I see Mozartian processes in things Raviji has done, and Ali Akbar Khan as well. Hans is Hans Zimmer, is so brilliant at this thing that he knew how to convey, how to accumulate, how to accumulate, how to accumulate so much energy, yeah, so much amazing. impulse, and at one point, boom, you needed that silence to be able to digest. Yeah, yeah. Then that silence became part of the music. I'm going to tell you something technical. We don't have much time left within this last hour, but I'm going to tell you this real quick. Mozart used to do that, and he put it on writing on his part. You know what he did, Dr. Andres? When you finish something, Mozart, the end of the score, he puts a point d'orgue, a calderon, we say in Spanish, is a, 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 a symbol in music that means holding. Okay, it's yeah. like this, and there's a dot. When that is on top of, of, a, of a note, you sustain that note for a long time. Mm -hmm. He would put that over the last two bars after the, after the piece finished. He would put a calderon in top. You go like, what the heck is that supposed to mean? Well, that, what that means is exactly what you just described, is we need to be able to have time to... Now the piece finished. You have not finished the experience yet while you're still processing, you're experiencing still the rest of the accumulated effect of all that dynamic that happened of tension release at the end. And then he writes, we need to pause so that the audience can... Now we can go that to the next man, movement. That man is a proper phenomenologist. There you go. Yeah, because silence is not the absence of sound. Silence is another way of experiencing something. So for, for a physicist, maybe silence is the absence of sounds. But from a phenomenological point of view, silence is an experience. And silence sounds. It has a sound. Of course. Of course. What a pleasure to do this thing with you. We did several sections and it's That's always true. never enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need so to I do this again. Exactly, let's do it again.